Thank you very much, uh, Dahi. Uh, I must admit, uh, you know, with the European edifice sort of visibly crumbling and the gorgeous weather outside, uh, to get you here to talk about farm policy yet again is, uh, makes me slightly uneasy. But I suppose in, in defense of the topic, uh, you know, clearly we have become much more aware of the importance of protecting and, and uh, maintaining our natural environment. We were meeting uh, in the same week as the Rio Plus uh, 20 meeting uh, is going on. Uh, and even at a more prosaic level, uh, if we think about uh, the debate around the European budget in the coming um, multi-annual uh, period, um, Gina's excellent background paper tells us that uh, the Commission proposal uh, is for uh, payment appropriations over the seven years of 972 uh, billion euro. Now, uh, a number of the, the net contributor member states have argued that uh, they are tightening their belts at home and the uh, European Union should do the same, and they have suggested uh, perhaps reducing that by uh, around 100 billion or so. And what we're talking about today, uh, the greening of the cap, would actually cost us over that period 70, uh, sorry, not 70, uh, 90 billion euro. So you can see that if you're trying to find 100 billion, uh, and if you think that you know, what is being proposed or on the table uh, uh, regarding greening isn't very sensible, uh, then you can see uh, where uh, greedy eyes might, might want to look. So just, just in terms of the, the sort of context of what uh, we're, we're talking about. Um, now, the Commission, as everybody knows, has put forward its legislative proposals for the uh, uh, revised uh, CAP uh, regulations. Um, it has sort of three major themes, uh, redistribution between the member states, uh, the targeting of the direct payments, and the greening of uh, the CAP, mainly the direct payments, but there are other, one or two other elements uh, involved as well. So greening is really, in a sense, the big idea of, of uh, Commissioner Chalice's uh, reform, um, but it has proved very controversial. Uh, it's not that everybody's in favor of greening. It's hard to be against a, a better environment. But the particular measures that the Commission has proposed to implement and to achieve its targets have proved uh, very divisive. We have the environmental NGOs on the one hand, at least initially coming out and saying, look, it's all green wash, it's not greening. Uh, we have the farmers saying, look, you're uh, you're um, undermining our competitive ability, our ability to produce more food, which is what the world needs at this time. And you have the member states uh, throwing their, their hands in the air and saying, oh, my goodness, yet more bureaucracy, yet more complexity, and we're trying to simplify the cap. So you really have had a range of <laughs> quite negative reactions in many ways to what the Commission has uh, proposed. So what I, I want to try to do in, in the sort of 20 minutes I have is to really try to explain the issues at stake um, I know, looking around, that many of you in the audience are, are perhaps more expert on the details than I am, but I want to try to avoid the details. I want to try to really take the perspective, not so much of the farmer, um, uh, where obviously this is hugely important and the details become extremely important, uh, but rather to take the perspective of the taxpayer and, and really to try to, to sort of paint the broad picture. Rather, we can get into the details if people want uh, during the question and, 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 and a session. So really, the kind of basic theme is, you know, are we, getting, are we going to get value for money? Which I think is a reasonable question to ask at, in, in this time of economic crisis. Are we going to get value for money in terms of additional environmental benefits from uh, what the Commission is uh, proposing? And we might sort of say, well, why greening? And uh, I, I think the, the answer is, is pretty obvious. Uh, there is no doubt that the natural environment across Europe is under stress. We have very uh, good documentation from the European uh, Environment Agency on this. Uh, uh, biodiversity is declining despite uh, the commitment to achieve stable uh, stability in, in biodiversity uh, by 2020. There have been improvements in, in water quality, but nonetheless it's uh, highly unlikely that uh, um, or, Shall I put it the other way? It's highly likely that uh, a, a significant proportion of Europe's fresh waters will not reach good quality status by, uh, by 2020, as required under the Water Framework Directive. Uh, we have problems with soil, uh, soil erosion, uh, uh, diminishing soil uh, organic uh, carbon. Um, we all are aware of the climate uh, change, uh, greenhouse gas emissions, which uh, represents a substantial challenge uh, for uh, the farming sector. And, you know, there is a, a sort of growing unease and concern about the resilience of the type of 
uh, agriculture that uh, uh, has developed over uh, recent decades to cope with uh, you know, pests and diseases, the loss of ecosystem services, and so on. So I think there are really uh, major challenges, and it is correct that we try to use public policy uh, to address uh, these uh, challenges. Uh, the question is, of course, how best to incentivize farmers uh, and other land managers to adopt uh, farming practices which contribute to uh, improvements in these environmental uh, outcomes. And just uh, to sort of take up at this point the argument that you know, food production is too important at this point in time. Uh, to actually be distracted by, by, by greening. The, it's an argument we hear that uh, you know, we can't afford to lose uh, uh, agricultural land in Europe to nature. Uh, we need it to uh, 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 pr produce more food uh, for, uh, the global, um, uh, uh, for global demand. Um, of course, one argument uh, is that um, a good environment and, 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 and higher agricultural output are actually at least in the longer term, they are actually complements rather than substitutes. Now, I think clearly that is true um, in, the, in the longer term, but at the same time, I do feel that probably uh, uh, over the uh, period we're talking about, uh, that we do have a trade-off. But that is not to say that environmental uh, values, environmental benefits, are not a legitimate goal for public policy. In fact, one might argue that as uh, farm uh, prices uh, are, are expected to remain buoyant, and in a sense the profitability of, of, of agricultural uh, production um, uh, uh, is, is going to perhaps be, be higher in the future, um, the, the opportunity cost of providing environmental services, which in a sense the public uh, uh, has to pay for because there is no market for, for many of these services, um, that in a sense uh, uh, th that environment is one where perhaps farmers have less need for direct income support and the environment has greater need for, 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 for support. Um, it's also interesting, of course, that many of the people who argue, uh, or many of the voices who argue that um, uh, we can't afford uh, at this point in time to, uh, to, to transfer, uh, you know, to take land out of, of food production, um, uh, you know, are also uh, quite strong advocates of biofuel policies. And I would argue that, in fact, uh, the biofuel mandates are, are doing far more to reduce, in a sense, Europe's contribution to food supply than, uh, than greening is, 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 is likely to do. Now, having said that, of course, uh, that's not to say that there isn't, as I say, a conflict, and we should design policy to try to minimize the trade-off as much as possible. Uh, so we do need an efficient policy, uh, and we do need a policy which justifies the taxpayer resources, the very considerable taxpayer resources which uh, will be attributed or allocated to this uh, objective. Now, Green New Course is already a part of the cap and has been for quite some time. So we're not starting with a, with a green sheet. Um, we have greening in so-called Pillar 2, that's the uh, rural development programs. Uh, these are what funds the, um, uh, the agri-environment measures in member states. Uh, what's characteristic of these measures is that they are voluntary uh, for farmers and that the payments uh, reflect the costs of providing the particular environmental benefits. And that link between payment and, and, and cost, of course, makes these payments uh, compatible with uh, WTO uh, green box uh, requirements. In addition, we have had mandatory greening uh, through uh, uh, cross-compliance standards, the, the uh, uh, GAIAC, the General, um, uh, the Good Agricultural Environmental Conditions Standards, some of those concern greening uh, since, 1920, uh, sorry, since 2003. Um, and also in the health check uh, in 2008, uh, we had greening introduced uh, through Article 68, technical terms many of you will be aware of, but essentially it allowed for the first time uh, some Pillar 1 money to be used uh, to support agricultural activities which were beneficial for the environment. And indeed the Irish government has used that opportunity to support farming in the Burren, for example. Uh, but that was the first time that we actually had uh, payments through Pillar 1 uh, for uh, greening purposes. Now, in terms of uh, the options available to the Commission, uh, so the Commission wants to do something with greening, how to go about it? And essentially, there were four options on the table. One was to pursue greening through strengthening Pillar 2, 
which indeed had been uh, uh, increased as a share of the CAP budget uh, it, through the Fischler years, through the uh, uh, Fischer-Bull uh, period. Um, uh, the difficulty here, of course, is that there was clearly no willingness on the part of the member states to increase uh, the Pillar 2 budget. And what's important to recall here is that the Pillar 2 uh, budget, the share of the cap going to rural development as opposed to the, uh, the direct payments and market uh, support uh, Pillar 1 element, is not going to be determined by the agricultural ministers. That is part of the uh, debate on the uh, multi-annual financial framework, which is being discussed by the European and Foreign, Affair Minister, Foreign Affairs Ministers in the General Council. So in a sense, the agricultural people really have very little outcome, uh, very little influence, you might argue, on that particular uh, uh, debate. But as I say, it was quite clear that there wasn't any real appetite to continue increasing the share of Pillar 2, in part because Pillar 2 is co-financed by the member states. And many member states are having difficulty coming up with their share of the, uh, the funding in order to draw down the EU funds. So they didn't want more of that. Another possibility uh, would have been to have raised the GAIAC standards, these mandatory um, uh, uh, standards for good agricultural environmental condition, which farmers um, are required to observe in order to become eligible for the Pillar 1 payments. And we'll come back to, to look at that in a moment. A third option is what was called conditional greening. Now, this uh, had a brief um, uh, appearance in the Albert Dess report, um, the first version of the... Albert Dess was the rapporteur uh, for the Committee on Agriculture um, on the, um, uh, the Commission's communication in 2010, setting out its vision for how the cap reform uh, might, might look. And uh, Albert Dess, I, I met him when I was uh, there in February, very nice man, he got roasted for this particular proposal and it, it disappeared uh, from his final uh, report. But conditional greening would have meant that, uh, in a sense, farmers would get their green payment in Pillar 1 by enrolling in a, a sort of an entry level, a basic agri-environment scheme in Pillar 2. So, in a sense, the... The, the bureaucracy and so on of, of monitoring and auditing and so on, that would be part of Pillar 2, where member states are well used to doing this. Uh, they've run these schemes now for over two decades. Uh, but the payment would come from Pillar 1. But as I say, that's not a runner. Uh, 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 so uh, we have the fourth uh, option, which was to pursue further greening through Pillar 1, which is what the Commission uh, opted for. And uh, their legislative proposal, I just sort of quote, an important element uh, is to enhance the overall environmental uh, performance of the cap through the greening of direct payments by means of certain agricultural practices beneficial for the climate and the environment that all farmers will have to follow, which go beyond cross-compliance and are in turn the basis for Pillar 2 measures. A payment 30% of the annual national ceiling of each member state uh, for the Pillar 1 uh, for farmers following agricultural practices, uh, beneficial for the climate and the environment, three are mentioned, crop diversification, maintenance of permanent pastures, and ecological focus areas. Um, organic farming uh, is automatically assumed to meet the criteria, uh, 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 an issue which I'll come back to, um, and small farmers, there's a small, uh, farmers enrolling in the so-called smaller farm scheme uh, would be exempt from the uh, requirements. So just to sort of in case uh, people are not fully aware, we're going to be talking about these three measures as a crop diversification. The idea here is that any uh, uh, arable farmer uh, should, have a min should have at least three crops at any one, at any one time, uh, uh, where the arable land exceeds three hectares. That was the commission uh, proposal. Um, and and uh, it, it was, was not used entirely for, uh, uh, for grass uh, production. So it doesn't affect grazing, uh, uh, livestock farms. Uh, this is really a measure for arable farms and farms with permanent uh, crops. Then the permanent pasture requirement that farmers shall maintain as permanent pasture, uh, permanent grassland, actually, uh, the areas of their holdings declared as such in the claim year 2014. We'll come back to that year in a moment, but the idea that farmers at the individual holding level uh, should maintain, I think there's a tolerance of about 5%, but they should maintain as permanent grassland 
the, that area of permanent grassland they declared in 2014. Uh, just to make the point that there is already uh, a requirement to maintain the level of permanent grassland in a member state. Okay, so that already exists, which is a bit different to the other two requirements. The commission proposal would move it from the member state, where the idea is perhaps you could make up for a farmer who ploughed grassland in one part of the country by a farmer who uh, uh, took land out of uh, uh, arable farming in another part. Um, this would now apply at the individual holding level. And the third measure is the so-called ecological focus areas. Uh, farmers, again, it's uh, arable, uh, uh, arable land and permanent crops, uh, shall ensure that at least 7% of their eligible hectares, so that's excluding areas under permanent grassland, uh, is ecological focus areas. And they uh, give a number of illustrative examples. This isn't a full list. Uh, land left fallow, so if you leave land uh, fallow. Uh, terraces, if you have slopes. Uh, landscape features, which would include things like hedges, lines of trees, small um, uh, water uh, areas, uh, and so on, buffer strips along uh, uh, waterways, and uh, certain types of forested areas. So uh, the commissioner is very um, careful to point out that he doesn't intend this to be set aside. We had set aside as a supply management measure in the past where farmers were required to take land out of production and leave it fallow. Uh, he sees the, this is quite different to set aside. The, this is intended to promote uh, uh, environmental and ecological uh, uh, benefits. And we'll see, of course, that whether that happens or not depends very much on the management of, of these areas. Now, the novelty of the pro Commission's proposals, as I say, mandatory greening in Pillar 1. Why? Well, three reasons. First of all, the Commission argued that Pillar 2 is inadequate in terms of really focusing in on the areas, the farmland areas, where the environmental pressures are greatest. Pillar 2 is a, is, a, is a voluntary scheme. Obviously, if you enter the scheme, you accept certain obligations. Those obligations have a cost. So it's clear there will be some self-selection of farmers. The farmers for whom it is easiest to meet the requirements will be the ones who will join the scheme. And if you're an intensive arable farmer, if you're an intensive dairy farmer, you're probably not going to be interested. So only 24% of the farmed uh, land area is actually enrolled in Pillar 2 schemes. And the, pillar, and the Commission has consistently argued that they want every farmer to be uh, involved. And that wasn't going to be possible, they argued, through uh, Pillar 2. The second reason, uh, I, I already explained, the lack of political support to increase the budget for Pillar 2. So if only 24% of the land is covered, uh, enrolled at the moment, clearly you'd need a much bigger budget if you wanted to get up to uh, close to 100%. And the third reason, which I think is probably at the heart of things, is what the Commission documents call visibility. In other words, what we are engaged in here is an exercise really to justify the continuation of uh, the stream of direct payments. It was clear that the old arguments, they were compensation for price reductions and so on, no longer uh, 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 were, were convincing. How do you justify to taxpayers that farmers continue to get uh, uh, this stream of, of, of payments? Essentially, you require some additional conditionality, some greening conditionality. The idea here is that, in a sense, the stream of payments should continue, but we're looking for ways and, from some perspectives, the minimum amount of conditions which will actually justify uh, the continuation of, of, of the payments. The other alternative is to see the direct payments. We have 30%. It's about 13 billion a year. The Pillar 2 schemes are about 3.5 billion a year, so it would be a major increase in spending on agri-environment measures. Let's take that 13 billion, so it means the basic payment to farmers drops by that amount, and let's ask if we had 13 billion a year, how would we use that money to get the maximum environmental benefit? It's a very different question, and uh, I think, as I would come to at the end, uh, it, it, we would actually arrive at a different answer to, to, to where the Commission has come. However, 
we're going to stick with the Commission's proposals for a moment. Uh, they're Pillar 1 proposals. That immediately imposes certain constraints on the type of measures which you could um, uh, include or, or require farmers to abide by. Because Pillar 1 measures are annual measures, uh, they're annual payments. Um, and if you want all farmers to be involved, they have to be simple, they have to be generalizable, and they have to be annual. And that immediately limits the list of things really to the three that, uh, that uh, we have just come, come down to. And just to, in parentheses to make the point that it seems to me, it's not explicit anywhere, but it seems to me that in coming to the uh, proposals, the Commission has been very influenced by the Swiss example. Because essentially, what Swiss farmers are required to do, by and large, is what the Commission is, propose, is proposing for European farmers. There are differences, uh, but just to make the point that if you want to look at uh, how the, um, uh, the greening measures might, might work out in practice, Switzerland is, is, is where you should uh, look at. Now, a number of general issues, uh, and as I say, I'm going to skip the details because uh, we can cover those in, 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 um, in, in passing in questions. I mean, an obvious question, why 30%? Where did that figure come from? Was it based on an analysis of environmental need, of the sort of investments required to get to certain environmental uh, objectives? It seems to have come from the air. And as a result, it's going to be very difficult to defend that position. The member states are already suggesting that 10% would actually be uh, very, uh, quite sufficient, thank you uh, very much. Um, one of the, the curious effects of taking a percentage, 30%, is of course that the value of the greening payment will differ across the member states because the value of the entitlements uh, differs across the member states. That of course is one of the issues that uh, the reform is intended to address. Um, but it, it, it will mean that, um, uh, and you know, I think there is an argument that if you have a basic income support payment, what a Latvian farmer needs is not the same as what an Irish farmer needs. But if you have a greening payment, why, why should the Latvian farmer get less than the Irish farmer? It's, 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 it's harder to, to, to justify in a supposedly common policy. And in fact, if we actually think, take it to the Irish case, one of the um, uh, options in the legislation is that a country can regionalize its, uh, its, its um, direct payment. So this is an issue we're not really talking about, but a, a, another part of the proposal is that um, uh, countries should move to a flat rate, a uniform uh, value of the payment entitlements over, over time. In Ireland, we, we have the historic basis, that means that what farmers uh, receive as the value of their entitlement depended on uh, what they were doing in 2000 uh, to 2002. Some farmers get a lot of money, uh, other farmers get nothing at all. Um, so it's clearly uh, not justifiable. The Commission has proposed that we should move to a uniform system, uh, uniform value of the entitlement. But they do say, look, it doesn't have to be uniform across every hectare. You, could, you, you have flexibility. If you want to divide your country into regions, and there's different ways, you can do it by administrative boundaries, you can do it by biophysical boundaries, uh, you can have different payments. Now, let's suppose, uh, it hasn't been suggested, but let's suppose the, 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 the Irish uh, uh, government decides to have two regions in Ireland. Because there is a big debate as to whether uh, moving to, to uh, a uniform uh, regional payment wouldn't shift payments from uh, more productive areas in the, in the country, the south and east, to so-called less productive areas in the north and, and the west. Somewhat skeptical of that argument, but there certainly would be a shift of, of payments of that kind. One way of sort of limiting that is that you would divide the country into two regions and have higher payments in the east and south, and you would have lower payments uh, corresponding to the sort of average that's there at the moment, um, in, the, in the West and North. Now, the greening payment is to be 30% of the overall total. It's not clear in the regulation whether that also has to apply to the individual farm payments. But I, my understanding, Aidan, you can correct me later, is that indeed that would be the case. So we have the situation where your intensive dairy farmer in Waterford doing a fantastic job at producing milk 
uh, on sort of uh, single sward ryegrass farm, not much biodiversity, is getting 30%, that's maybe 200 uh, euro per hectare. And your farmer in Cotamara, um, who maybe has very uh, uh, species rich grasslands, something you actually want to maintain, uh, is going to get 50 uh, uh, euro per hectare. Um, you know, can you justify that to the taxpayer if indeed this is meant to be an environmental payment? So there's many interesting uh, sort of general questions that, that arise. Mandatory or not, the re basic regulation is, 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 is confusing uh, on this respect. It's clear that the Commission wanted every farmer to, 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 uh, to take up this measure, but how to enforce that? I mean, if your intensive um, uh, uh, arable farmer decides uh, it's 30%, I can actually uh, make that by farming uh, uh, boundary to boundary. I'm, I'm not interested. Um, there is some suggestion that there would be penalties. And the way this has been interpreted is that you could indeed lose some of your basic income payment if indeed you uh, weren't fulfilling uh, the greening uh, requirements. Now that would be, in a sense, mandatory because we know how important the basic income payment is to, to, to most uh, European uh, farms. But um, if indeed that was the case, why not actually simply put the requirements into the GAIAC, which already apply to every farmer? Why create a sort of second stream of payments uh, uh, to farmers? And indeed, if it's meant to be voluntary, which is quite clearly the way it's going, both the uh, Council of Ministers and the uh, uh, rapporteur's report in, 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 in the Comagri and the Parliament, uh, suggest that there would be no penalty to your basic payments. So it, it will be a, a voluntary scheme. So if it's a voluntary scheme, why not make it in Pillar 2 um, uh, rather than in, in, in Pillar 1? So uh, those are some of the general issues. Uh, I'm conscious of the time, uh, Dahi, so I'm going to... Uh, just mention um, the two other big issues, of course, is the administration, the fact that member states already are having difficulty interpreting the, the regulations uh, uh, for the payments. Um, spending some time in Denmark, uh, you might think if any European country could get it right, it would be Denmark. Denmark is facing huge fines from the Commission at the moment for uh, uh, misinterpreting uh, the current uh, CAP uh, rules. Um, so there's a problem about uh, increasing complexity, um, and uh, uh, the other issue is the one-size-fits-all. The idea that, you know, from Riga to Roundstone, uh, that the same type of agricultural practices are appropriate to address the environmental needs that we all accept uh, are, are there. And, you know, if you talk or listen to the people from the... Uh, ecology uh, side of the fence and, and, and the biology and so on, um, it seems that measures need to be much more targeted, much more locally uh, oriented than these generalized one-size-fits-all uh, measures. And that has been the major two areas, the administrative costs and the desire for flexibility, which has driven in particular uh, the Council of Agricultural Ministers. And uh, there was a paper uh, produced in, in April at the Council formally tabled by Luxembourg, but um, I think it had the support of about 15 uh, member states, uh, which basically um, wanted to give uh, flexibility. And we've discussed the other options, um, a menu approach. A menu approach could, could, could take place at the EU level. In other words, instead of just having three measures, if we could find other sort of simple, generalizable <coughs> annual measures, green cover, for example, or uh, it's, it's, it's actually quite hard, but if you could extend the, 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 the menu at the, at the European level, or you could extend the menu at the, at the national level, you could have a range of, of uh, options, uh, different measures that farmers would have to choose uh, a number of them in order to become eligible uh, for the payment. Um, green by definition. Uh, I mentioned earlier that organic farmers would be considered exempt, or exempt is perhaps not the right word, they would be considered as having met the greening criteria by virtue of being organic, and uh, therefore would receive the payment. Um, and that has given rise to, a number of member states have seen this as a sort of a, uh, an opening in the door, why not farmers who are already involved in any type of agri-environment scheme? I mean, surely these are green by definition farmers, they're, they're farmers who are 
doing more for the environment than, than, than other farmers, why not simply say, OK, you're doing your bit. You get the green payment automatically. And again, I think this is probably going to happen. The, the Council of Ministers seems to want it. Uh, the Comagri uh, rapporteur has supported it. But from the taxpayer point of view, um, farmers who are in pillar two, yes, they're doing more for the environment, but they're getting paid for it. There's a very detailed costing of each of the measures that they undertake. They're getting paid for that. We're now saying, OK, we're paying you for your, uh, your, your, the practices you're doing in pillar, in pillar two, but we're also going to give you the green payment in pillar one. I think there's a real issue of double payment there, which the Commission really didn't think through uh, in their organic uh, farming uh, measure. So there are other issues, to raising the GAIAC standards, which I know is something that uh, has been pushed um, by our own department, and maybe we can come back to that. Um, but let me just conclude, Dahi, because I've run over my time, um, just to sort of say, well, you know, I've been critical of the uh, proposals. As I say, there's a lot of detail in the three measures that uh, has raised a lot of concern, uh, particularly in terms of how they would be implemented at farm level. Um, what, you know, what would be a, a, a way forward? And of course, I have the luxury of being an academic, so uh, I, don't, uh, I don't have to worry so much about whether uh, one's thoughts are, are feasible or politically real, re realistic. And I'm fully aware that uh, the argument could be made, look, the train has left the station, the Commission has made its proposals, the member states are engaged on those proposals, the rapporteur, um, uh, Campoulos Santos, has in a sense actually supported by and large the, the framework of the Commission's proposals while making uh, various uh, amendments to, to, to kind of make them a little bit more, more flexible and so on. But it seems to me that um, what we might have done is to have actually used the pillar two approach. Um, we might have taken that 30%, and over a six-year period, we might have moved it, and it could be done not by the foreign ministers sitting in the general council, but through something called modulation. It's possible to modulate. It's, it's there as one of the options anyway, um, uh, up to 10%, but require the 30% to be moved to pillar two. Not in one year, because clearly you can't bump up uh, uh, agri-environment schemes, which currently are absorbing about 3.5 billion, uh, to absorbing uh, 16 billion. But over a five uh, or seven year period, uh, that would be possible. And of course, the basic payment would be reduced. So there is a, 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 an implication there for, for, farm, uh, for farm incomes. Um, specify and monitor the environmental targets. It is rather extraordinary that we are proposing quite major changes in European agricultural policy without any clear idea of what are the, are the objectives. How are we going to evaluate whether we're actually getting better environmental outcomes? There's, there's very little discussion in the impact assessment in terms of what I, 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 these measures are going to achieve beyond sort of general measures. So I think let's specify the measures. If necessary, and I think it would be necessary, let's put into the GAIAC, um, uh, where member states do have some flexibility in interpretation, uh, the three measures that the Commission has, uh, has, has proposed. Um, so uh, um, these would be uh, offered, um, sorry, let me, I'm going a little bit too fast. So I'm suggesting uh, one could have modulated uh, the money to pillar two, uh, you, you should specify clearly what the, the targets and objectives that member states should achieve with this money. Uh, you should uh, require, uh, as part of member states' uh, agri-environment measures that they offer, uh, the three uh, uh, funding uh, to support crop rotation, uh, uh, maintenance of permanent grasslands, and uh, ecological focus areas. Um, but I would also include these in the GAIAC standards so that it simply isn't an optional extra, that it does, in a sense, uh, deal with the, the Commission's uh, concern about universality. Um, and indeed, uh, I would go further and suggest that uh, uh, resources should be shifted from those member states that are not, uh, you know, don't implement uh, agri-environment measures, which are su 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 sufficiently successful in terms of the objectives, and to shift resources uh, over time to those member states that actually are 
achieving, overachieving on the uh, environmental uh, benefits. That would be my suggestion. As I say, I don't accept, I, I agree that it's probably not politically re realistic, but I think it's only fair to at least put my own thoughts on the table when I'm perhaps critical of the Commission's approach. Thank, Thank you. you very much indeed.